Good afternoon to you. I am Mark Suddeth in Wilmington, North Carolina. It is Monday, the 22nd of May, 2023, and you have tuned into the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Good to have you with me. We're going to talk about that yellow area down there in the southwest Atlantic. We'll also look at the typhoon that is rapidly getting its act together in the western Pacific, going to be a big impact for our friends over in Guam. And then we will look at everything else that we typically take a gander at on these updates. Sea surface temperature anomalies, what's happening with the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon, and other random weather newsmaker headlines, whatever, including some limited, but not zero. It's just the pattern's not very favorable, and that is severe weather. We'll look at that as well. All right, let's get on with it. First stop, tabs up here. Well, we'll look at Typhoon Mawar here over in the Westpac. This is courtesy of TropicalTidbits.com. There it is, rapidly getting its act together, developing a core, definitely, and uh, this could become a super typhoon, and uh, basically eclipsing Category 5 on the Saffir Simpson scale, eventually. There's Guam, right up here, and our uh, fine service men and women over there at our Air Force Base, they're going to really have to batten down the hatches, as well as the locals over there. I wonder if any chasers are going to fly out there and intercept this. If they do, they've got to be in the air now. But yeah, this is going to be a significant impact. This is what the track looks like from the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. There is the forecast for this typhoon for the center line, which cuts just across the southern part of Guam. Now, this is your friendly reminder that this is for the center. Remember, these things are much larger than just the center. So when people say, oh, it is forecast to do this or that, they're talking about the center. And that's what these maps show. The, these maps tell us nothing about the impacts generally. Yes, they have wind speeds on there, but you have to understand the impacts, the effects extend well beyond that tiny little typhoon graphic or whatever that icon is. The skinny black line, we always have to remember the impacts. And I bet because of social media and the fact that Guam is connected to all of that, that we see some spectacular video coming out of the big waves that will be coming in first and then if they do take a direct hit yes the wind and else uh, and the other impacts now look Guam built very solid they are no strangers to typhoons nevertheless it's not pleasant it's not like they welcome them with open arms but it will be interesting to see what kind of video we get out of there in the coming days as this typhoon a western Pacific typhoon heads towards that area and then you see Later on, it meanders over the open Pacific, headed toward the Philippines, but I think it'll turn north eventually. We'll see about that. That's all about troughs and ridges. You know how that goes when we track Atlantic hurricanes. Now, here's a look out uh, from Anderson Air Force Base. This is from the Dr. Mark Nissenbaum website. I want to make sure we mention that and show this. At the top here, we've uh, shown this radar uh, products from Dr. Nissenbaum many a time. Very, very useful, especially when you can get a lot of frames. I think I loaded up 75 frames and sped it up. There's Guam right there. So the typhoon has quite a while to go before it reaches up there, but those are those outer bands starting to move in. And uh, I'll put a link to this radar in today's video update. And uh, if you want to check it out, you can. Very nice that uh, Dr. Nissenbaum provides that. So here's a tweet from National Weather Service, Guam. Remember, they're one of the U.S. territories, just like Puerto Rico. So there is a weather service office there. As it continues to strengthen with maximum sustained winds uh, at 105 miles per hour, yeah, that's, um, that's getting up there. And it looks like it could track pretty close to Guam with impacts forthcoming pretty soon. This was issued a few hours ago, but I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is what it looks like on the Tropical Tidbits site there's the typhoon down there now I can't zoom in there's just not a domain as we call it where you can really get clarity on uh, the different geographic features so I'm just gonna point out there's Guam right there now watch how close as I put this into motion frame by frame the overall typhoon I mean the L is practically right on top of them and again if we could really zoom in I know the H wharf does but I'm just showing you the GFS here it looks like a really close call if not directly passing the core over the island and that is looking at about 36 hours or so until that happens and then it moves on out into the west pacific south of big old area of high pressure up here as you would expect 
with a westward-moving tropical cyclone, and then it rounds the periphery of that, gets really intense there east of the Philippines. That's where it could become a super typhoon. Those uh, waters and the atmosphere, the overall environment in the Philippine Sea, areas east of the Philippines, the far western Pacific, we get some very, very powerful typhoons there, and it won't surprise me if this is our first Category 5 super typhoon, whatever you want to call it, intense, intense tropical cyclone of 2023. Mawar there looks like a candidate to do just that. All right, what's happening in the Atlantic? Well, we started getting seven-day outlooks just for what it's worth. And here it is. This is a, a disturbance down there in the southwest Atlantic. And it's just a broad area of low pressure, strong upper-level winds, and dry air. you got to have a lot of moisture, especially in the mid-levels. And that's just not prevalent. So not a lot of development expected from this system. Only 10% overall. This is what it looks like on the satellite animation, which gives us a good shot of the lower 48 in Central America, Northern South America. All right, and then there's the system right there. It doesn't look like much at all. Strong upper level winds cutting across the area, the dry air that's down there. Just a little bit too soon for this one to amount to much, but it does have, and that's that signature that I look for. I told you I was gonna show you this often. So here it is, living up to my word there. That's the vorticity. The spin is there, but dry air and the wind shear just not going to allow this to do much. And that's typically what we would think would happen in late May. It's not time for this stuff yet, really. I mean, yes, we've seen early season development, even, you know, preseason development, as it's called, in most of the years. What, since 2015 all the way through 2021, we had nothing last year uh, in the preseason, right? So we broke that streak. But yeah, it's just a little too soon, too much strong upper level winds and that kind of thing. All right, let's talk about some of the other topics that I usually broach. I think that's the word as uh, we look at this, this stuff every week. The sea surface temperature anomaly map is really interesting. It's been that way for several months. It continues to be, yes, we have the developing El Nino, but I mean, it's really taking its time. That ramp up towards super El Nino or whatever, I don't think that's going to happen early, and so I think we're going to have a busy hurricane season in the Atlantic because this El Nino is just kind of you know slowly getting there, right? We're not really ramping things up quickly, and in the uh, same time frame, right, we've got this very warm Atlantic. Lots of talk about that. The main development region down here, the whole of it now, all the way across from Africa into the Caribbean and beyond, all of it above average, and that is starting to trigger some of the climate models to suggest a much more active Atlantic hurricane season. Yes, there will be shear. Yes, there will be dry air. Yes, there will be all the people that say, oh, the season's not going to do anything because we don't have a major hurricane by August 1st or something. But this look strongly correlates with a very busy season, even in the face of the developing El Nino, which is not that strong just yet. There are different degrees of El Nino, literally and uh, figuratively, and this one's just not going to reach the level, I think, where it completely shuts down the Atlantic with sheer and sinking air. Sinking air dries out, by the way, so sinking air becomes dry air, typically. Uh, this is just, again, a very interesting look. Plus, we still have the pretty cold look to the PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's warmed up in the northern reaches of it as of late. But yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And there's this. I showed you this last week. I want to show you again. I'm going to refresh it so we can get the GIF animation to run again. The subsurface, look at that. It thins out. It looks like real robust, like, oh, man, Super El Nino is coming. And then it just kind of thins out. See right there? You can see as well as I can. There's not much back here in the West Pack to reinforce what's happening in the Central and Eastern Pacific. This is the surface up at the top. Yes, it's warm. Yes, it's anomalously warm. And we do have a pretty deep area and, and uh, robust area of warm anomalies in the East Pack. But there's just not much there to reinforce it. And we've even lost some of those stronger anomalies. Look, we're at like 4 to 5 degrees Celsius early. And those have gone away. No reinforcements to come and really bolster this thing towards a strong El Nino 
by August. I just don't see it. Moderate El Nino, and you know, what do these numbers mean? Maybe, but we have to be there before it really matters, and we're not there yet. And we're only yeah, like a week or so away from the start of the Atlantic hurricane season with it really mattering and really having meaning August, September, October. And I think that those months could be busier than we were thinking by looking at ENSO anyway in the last couple of months. And this really helps to bolster that theory too. Look at this. This is the Hovmuller diagram. There's your easterlies right across the ENSO regions. Coming up as we end May and get into June, all the westerly wind stuff is way over, well past the dateline, which is 180 degrees longitude. And that's not going to help to kickstart the El Nino into high gear. Meanwhile, not much in the way of strong trades. There's a few blues showing up, but this is pretty significant. Right across the Enso region as we end the month and start the hurricane season, those blues are easterly winds blowing across, generally speaking, this area right through here, right? And that's not going to help El Nino strengthen. So very interesting look there to the Havmuller diagram from Dr. Michael Ventress' website. All right, sea surface temperatures. I had to do a double take on this. I guess I haven't showed this in a while. Are we really all the way up to the 27 Celsius? There's 28, 29, or is something wrong with our algorithm? I was like, what? I guess I haven't shown this in quite some time. The Gulf warmed really quickly. I got to make sure. I am showing it because I was looking at some other charts. I was like, well, I think it makes sense. But wow, I mean, it really jumped up quick. Now, it's always warm enough for intense hurricanes, so, you know, whatever. But we're, we're approaching Memorial Day, so I guess it should be this warm already. Look, there's the 28 Celsius line. That's about 82 Fahrenheit. But very, very warm once again in the northern Gulf up there off the coast of Louisiana. By the way, that does show up as a pretty strong anomaly right there. So I guess it is as warm. We're looking at three degrees warmer Celsius than normal. So I guess the map is correct. I just I remember when I looked at this as I was preparing everything, I was like, what? How did we get so warm so fast? Anyway, uh, off the Atlantic side and mid-Atlantic, let's zoom in so I can show you. Uh, you heading down to the coast here of mid-Atlantic in the northeast for Memorial Day. Yeah, going to be a little chilly, even if it's uh, full sunshine, which we'll see if it is. That little disturbance down there might try to pinwheel around and come towards the mid-Atlantic. Nothing tropical or whatever, but it, ah, we'll see about that. But uh, water temperature-wise, no, not very warm. Um, even down here in my neck of the woods, there's Wilmington right there. And we're talking about upper 60s to low 70s Fahrenheit. The really warm stuff out in the Gulf Stream, 26, 27 Celsius, or about 80, 81 Fahrenheit. All right, severe weather, not very prevalent right now because we don't have a lot of southwesterly flow across the Great Plains with moisture and shear. That is the simplest way to describe the lack of severe weather. Now look, severe weather, yes, can be both incredible to photograph interesting to see in person, but of course it's impactful. Even big time hail causes billions of dollars of damage a year. And we've gone through some anniversaries here recently. The Moore uh, EF5 tornado, the last one just occurred recently. Uh, the 10 year anniversary, that devastating tornado that took the lives of some storm chasers as well as other people in parts of the Moore area. We all remember that. So yes, you know, there, the severe weather is, is amazing to see but it does have consequences, but it also brings benefits, and that is rain, precipitation to parts of the Midwest that greatly need it. So when you see a lack of severe weather, it's good on one hand, but you did need that moisture. So you got to look at the whole balance of everything, I guess. Anyway, for today, this is the categorical slight risk there in parts of the Southern Plains. The tornado risk is very low. It's not zero. I always like to say that. You know, 2% is not the same as 0%. Could get some pretty strong winds on some of those downbursts from some of the thunderstorms that develop, and there is a threat of some large hail. But there's other areas as well, Florida, parts of the southeast, marginal conditions overall, and of course parts of Montana. It's just not widespread or particularly intense with the threat of supercell storms and tornadoes and really large hail. That's not on the table currently. Here's tomorrow. 
pretty much the same areas and the same general categories overall. Kind of a rinse and repeat type cycle, right? And then you guessed it on Wednesday. I bet we get a slight introduced by the time we get to Wednesday somewhere in that marginal area. And then beyond that time frame, it looks like we're going to get, this just shows basically, come on, you going to do it for me? Uh, nothing. And I think what's going to happen, we're going to get a big cutoff low over here, kind of migrating around. Some troughiness out west with some southwesterly flow uh, cutting across the general area of the plains with some moisture return. And so limited severe weather out here, but not much. So again, take it for what it's worth. No worries of big major tornadoes. We do need the precip for some of the growing regions out there. Chasers that had vacations planned, I don't know what to tell you. We'll have to just wait and see. If you're really good at the surface-based local forecasting the day of, you use the convectively allowing models, that kind of thing. You never know. You might see something interesting. All right. Speaking of something interesting, we do have our 2023 maps out. Poster size, ladies and gentlemen, it is. It's poster size. Let me get mine ready to show you. I've got to prove it to you, right? You can say pictures or it didn't happen. Well, here's a live shot from me and my big melon next to it, right? That's it. That's the 2023 map. If you want one, um, we sell these over on our, well, it's a link. It's not really a store. But, yes, you can purchase one. They're really cool. That's an old lost art of tracking on a piece of paper. There are tremendously amazing electronic versions apps we even have a great um, tracking map on our insider site for our patrons but the paper there's just something about plotting it yourself and I designed this way back in 1999 I've printed millions of these over the years for companies such as Lowe's all across the southeast a lot of different uh, TV stations and even radio stations back in the day remember radio I do they still have radio I'm just saying but you can get one I've made these every year and um, we uh, provide them to some of our patrons at certain membership levels and then I sell them to the general public and it helps with some funding of gas money or something like that but the main thing is it's a work of art it really is I drew that in Adobe Illustrator myself my degree is in geography so I better know how to do maps right and it's literally an original work of art and a lost art form of tracking maps that are made out of paper instead of all zeros and ones right so head to the link over on the description of today's video and you can get one. I fold them up and I put them in a brown envelope. I could roll them and put them in tubes, but then they got to be 25 bucks because the tubes are $3 and then it's like an extra 250 to mail those. I just try to keep it affordable, right? I want you to have one, but I want to make it where you can say, all right, I don't have to sacrifice whatever to get that map. You get the idea. All right, let me get this done and online for you. Uh, again, the Mark Nissenbaum link. The tracking map link all in today's description. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, and everything you can do to make the algorithm pop. I'd appreciate that. And I can keep coming back and doing this more for you. Have a great rest of your week. As always, thanks for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. Hope you learned something. I'm Mark Seth of Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you next week, if not before.